All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started here today. So welcome to everybody online and, of course, physically in the room. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our, our uh, colloquium and seminar speaker. This is Dr. Nevin Weinberg. Uh, so he comes to us from UT Arlington, and he earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago and his PhD in astrophysics from Caltech. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics at Santa Barbara. If you've never gotten a chance to visit there, find an excuse, participate in one of their programs and go. That place is amazing. Uh, and also at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he joined the MIT Physics Department as an assistant professor in 2011 and became an associate professor in 2016. He then joined the faculty at UT Arlington in 2020, where he is currently an associate professor of physics. His research interests include stellar fluid dynamics, tidal physics, gravitational wave sources, and thermonuclear explosions. But they just get more dramatic as you go up the list. Thermonuclear explosions on accreting neutron stars, or X-ray bursts, as they're politely called. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Weinberg here today to lecture on when stars go nonlinear, large amplitude tides, and stellar oscillations. Please welcome our speaker today. All right. Deaf in the audience online. Uh, okay. All good. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and for uh, uh, the introduction. Um, so uh, let's see, the picture you're looking at here, which uh, maybe some of you have been looking at now for a few minutes, is a picture of a uh, photograph, really, of Jupiter's moon Io taken by uh, the Voyager 1 mission in 1979 as it passed near Jupiter. And so Io is on a slightly eccentric orbit, uh, which means that it experiences a time-dependent uh, compression and expansion as it passes uh, closer and further from Jupiter. And that compression and expansion heats up Io's interior. And so Io is actually the most geologically active body in the solar system, despite its small size and age. Um, and a nice illustration of that geological activity is this volcanic plume you can see spewing out the top of Io here. Um, and so in this talk, I'm gonna be describing tides in completely fluid bodies, uh, not rocky bodies like Io. But I like this picture and this, uh, uh, this idea uh, because I think it nicely illustrates an important theme of the work I'll be talking about, which is that sometimes tides can have a really dramatic influence on a binary and its components. Um, as I'll describe. And so before I get going, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge my collaborators who have been working with me, with me on this problem for, for a number of years now, especially the students that have worked with me. Uh, so Reed Essek, who's now a postdoc at the Perimeter Institute, Mohamed Morabit, who's now a graduate student at UT Arlington working with me, uh, Deva Dija Pramanik, who's a graduate student at Princeton, and Hong Yu, who is a student who worked with me at MIT and is now a postdoc at Caltech. Um, and also, of course, the funding resources which have uh, supported this work. Let's see. No, oh, that's right. Oh, let's see. Well, I can always just click with my hands. That's fine. Um, okay, so this talk sort of can be broken up into two parts. In the first part, I'll be focusing on tides in stellar binaries and in exoplanet systems. So systems where you have two sun-like stars orbiting each other with short period orbits, orbital periods of days. So those are called solar binaries. Um, I'll uh, talk just very briefly actually about neutron star binaries, which are important gravitational wave sources, and uh, probably spend the most time on short period exoplanets, systems called hot Jupiters. Um, and then in the second part of the talk, I'll uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about seismology, stellar seismology, sometimes referred to as astero seismology. Um, and these are stars that are isolated, but have waves excited within them. And by studying those waves, um, observing those waves uh, with telescopes and then analyzing those observations, you can learn about the interior of the star. So basically these waves are uh, providing a window into the stellar interior that you wouldn't get from just the photons, which of course are just coming from the outermost layers of the star. Oh, right, it's not working. Oh, whoops. I see there's a delay, so let me... There we go. Um, so yeah, tides. So I think a nice place to start when you're talking about tides is the classic tide system, the one that Newton studied, the Earth and the Moon. Uh, so obviously this is very exaggerated. 
But the idea is that the uh, moon, of course, raises a tidal bulge on, uh, on the Earth, in the Earth's ocean. And that tidal bulge leads the moon's orbit, right? So the moon is orbiting in, in this counterclockwise direction, and the Earth is spinning in this counterclockwise direction. And the tidal bulge, or this angle delta, leads the moon's orbit. And the reason it leads is because the Earth is spinning faster than the moon orbits. Right? The Earth is spinning on a time scale of a day, and the moon is orbiting on a time scale of you know, 28 days. And so you can sort of think of this as the Earth is dragging the ocean at its, uh, you know, at the, the base of the ocean in the crust, uh, is dragging the water with it, and the moon is pulling it back. And the net effect is that this bulge slightly leads the moon. And if you now decompose the forces acting on the moon, there's a component of the force that's pointing towards the tidal bulge. And if you now think about it, there's an R cross F. There's a torque acting on the system. And that torque leads to an exchange of angular momentum. So the, uh, the Earth's spin is slowing down, is losing angular momentum, and the moon is gaining that angular momentum. And so as a result, the, Earth, uh, the, the Earth's spin is slowing down by something like two milliseconds per century. And the moon is moving away at something like four meters per century. Um, and we can actually measure that motion. As uh, small as it is, we can actually measure that motion because the Apollo astronauts left mirrors on the moon. And we can shine uh, laser lights from Earth at those mirrors and time how long it takes for that light to reflect. And that time allows us to measure the distance of the moon to a centimeter accuracy. Um, in fact, we need to account for where on the mirror the laser light hits, right? Because we're measuring it so accurately. Um, and so this four meters per century is roughly a nanometer per second, which is roughly the rate at which your fingernails grow. Um, and so this guy is showing how far the moon has moved away over the last 10 years. Uh, let me get used to the lag, okay. Good. So another interesting system where tides are important is hot Jupiters. So these are Jupiter mass planets uh, with orbital periods of just a few days. Um, in 2019, the Nobel Prize in Physics, half the Nobel Prize in Physics, was awarded to two astronomers, uh, Mayor and Kiloz, uh, for their discovery of the first exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star. And that planet was a hot Jupiter. So these are, you know, uh, Nobel Prize physics worthy uh, uh, systems. Uh, the other half of the Nobel Prize went to a cosmologist, Jim Peebles. And so if you now uh, analyze the tides in these systems, you can show that the torque is in the opposite direction from the Earth and the Moon. So the star is spinning more slowly than the planet orbits. The planet orbits with a time of maybe days, whereas the star spins if it's a star like our sun with periods of tens of days or a month. And so the bulge that the planet raises on the star lags the planet's orbit. It points uh, you know, behind it. And so if you now analyze the torques acting on the system, the planet is spinning up the star. It's transferring the orbital angular momentum to the spin of the star. The planet is losing angular momentum. And that means the planet is falling into the star at some rate. It's in spiraling into the star. And the question is, uh, and that you know, th this was something that people noticed or realized right away, you know, back in the early 90s when they first detected these systems. And you know, they were a big surprise when they first found them and they quickly realized that the tides would be dramatic in these systems. But the question for you know, all these years has been, what's the rate at which that in spiral occurs, that infall occurs? And that depends on the efficiency of tidal dissipation in the star. Essentially, what's the effective viscosity of the star? Um, and so I'll be describing work um, with my students that have addressed exactly um, that question. Um, what's the rate of, of infall? Okay, so how do you go about uh, studying these problems? So uh, you can do something, uh, or what you usually do is something that I like to call tidal perturbation theory. So the idea is you uh, take this spherical object, um, I'm just gonna make sure I have a timer so I can see what time it is. Um, so you have this spherical object uh, a star, and you put a companion uh, near it, and the spherical object becomes ellipsoidal. It takes on this kind of football-like shape, and the amplitude of that distortion, delta R over R, depends on the ratio of the masses of the companion, say the planet to the star, little m over big M, times the ratio of the radius of the star to the separation of the system cubed, right? And so if you now think about the fluid forces in the star, the fluid response of the star, the fluid equations are inherently nonlinear. 
So there's restoring forces due to pressure, due to buoyancy within the star, and you're perturbing those forces with this delta R over R. And so just like in a Taylor series expansion of a nonlinear equation, you get terms that are linear, nonlinear, and so on. Um, same is true with the fluid forces. There's a linear term. There's a term that's uh, uh, quadratic in delta R over R, cubic in delta R over R. So there's you know, this uh, full uh, expansion in terms of delta R over R that you can express the fluid response in terms of. And so um, what uh, most studies of tides you know, dating back uh, decades have assumed is that you can ignore these nonlinear terms. They've basically said, uh, for the systems that we're interested in, uh, we're going to assume that we can ignore those nonlinear terms and just do what you might call linear tidal theory. And really, the motivation was one of simplicity. It's a lot simpler to just keep the linear terms. The nonlinear terms, um, you know, as I'll give you a feel for, are complicated. And um, you know, in an ideal world, we could ignore them. Um, but the question, of course, is, is that you know, true for uh, the systems that we're studying? Is that a, a good description of, uh, of nature? Um, and so there's both, I think, observational motivations and theory motivations for not dropping those nonlinear terms in, in many of these systems. So from the observational side, some of the best measurements we have of tidal dissipation in binary systems comes from these observations of solar binaries, sun-like stars. And so we see these systems in, uh, in sometimes eccentric orbits. And you can show that over time, tides will circularize in orbit. And so you can use this uh, collection of solar binaries that astronomers have observed in clusters of, uh, of stars and place constraints on how efficient uh, tides will circularize a system. And when you uh, look at the numbers, you find that linear theory predicts what are called quality factors. So if you strike a bell and you ask how many times does it ring before the amplitude falls off by one e-folding, you say the Q of the bell is you know, 100 or 1,000. Uh, linear theory predicts that the Q of the star is 10 to the 9. So it's a measure of the viscosity of the star, the tidal dissipation efficiency. And so the larger the number, the less efficient. And so linear theory says 10 to the 9. But to fit the observations, to fit the circularization of these binaries, you need Qs more like a million, which tells you that linear theory is under predicting the efficiency of tidal dissipation by factors of a thousand or more. Question. They're, they're, they're out of contact, they're separated. Yeah, so they're orbital periods of, of a few days to tens of days. Um, and so you know, they're, they're, they're not Roche lobe overflow or anything like that. They're pretty close, yeah. And the tidal effects are, are strong, um, but they're still, there's no mass transfer between them. Um, so another system, another type of system where uh, there's indications that linear theory is uh, getting things wrong are these hot Jupiters. So um, when you look at the orbital distribution of hot Jupiters, how many planets there are as a function of orbital period, you find that there's, in, that there's evidence of orbital decay in these systems. Uh, there's measurements you can place on, or constraints anyways, that you can place on the Q of the star that is orders of magnitude smaller than the linear theory estimates. Again, just like with the solar binaries. Um, and then finally, there's uh, stars that some people call heartbeat stars. These are binaries that the Kepler Space Telescope saw that you see individual modes of oscillation, waves in the star excited. And there's pairs of waves that they see in any given, in some of these stars that whose frequencies add up to the frequency of a third wave, which is a, uh, exactly what you expect from nonlinear uh, uh, interactions of waves, um, you know, triplets of waves interacting with each other. Um, and so you can only explain those observations if you account for the nonlinear effects I'll be talking about. Um, so those are all the sort of observational motivations. On the theory side, um, you can do calculations of, uh, of tides and stars and show that the waves are going to reach such large amplitudes in portions of the star and regions of the star that they're going to become unstable to various nonlinear interactions um, and excite secondary waves. So the primary wave reaches a large amplitude and excites secondary waves. And I'll, I'll be talking more about this in a moment. But you can do these calculations that basically can convince you you need to account for these nonlinear effects, that the linear tidal theory is not enough in many of these systems. Um, and then 
uh, when you account for those nonlinear effects, uh, you can show that they significantly enhance the rate of tidal dissipation um, exactly in the direction that the observations are pointing in, that the, that the efficiency is greater than the linear theory predictions. Um, so these sort of considerations motivated us uh, about 10 years ago to develop some of the formalism and computational techniques to uh, study this problem of nonlinear tides. And so over the last few years, we've kind of been systematically applying uh, these tools to uh, a range of problems, including hot Jupiters, uh, compact object binaries, uh, binary neutron stars and white dwarfs, which are important gravitational wave sources, um, and also uh, isolated stars in which waves are excited through internal motions within the star, um, astroseismic measurements of red giants and other types of variable stars. Uh, and so there's this range of examples. In all of these cases, the question is, um, that we're interested in is uh, when are nonlinear effects important in which systems? And when they are important, how does it impact the system? How does it impact the evolution of the binary, for example? Um, and so an important uh, component of the story that I'll be telling you is that when the tide perturbs a star, it excites oscillations within the star, waves in the star, modes of oscillation. This is sometimes referred to as the dynamical tide. And so, uh, so I just wanted to give a very brief primer on, uh, on modes of stars and the types of oscillations they can support. Uh, so there is something known as P modes. Uh, the P stands for pressure. So pressure is the restoring force. So basically these are sound waves in the star. Uh, they tend to have short periods um, in the sun, periods of order minutes. Uh, there's what are called G modes, where G stands for gravity. So there, the uh, restoring force is buoyancy, or a, sort of like uh, gravity waves that you see when you throw a rock on, in a pond, right? These are internal gravity waves within the star. And they tend to have long periods, orbital uh, periods of, of hours to days. Uh, an important property of these G modes is that they only propagate in radiative regions of the star. So this is supposed to be like a sun-like star. And this sort of granular region is supposed to represent a convection zone. So the outer third of the sun is convective. And so these G modes can only propagate in the interior of a sun-like star. Um, and then finally, another class of modes that's important if the star is rotating rapidly enough are inertial modes, where the restoring force is the Coriolis force. And those tend to have periods of order, the spin period of the star. And so a particularly important class uh, of modes for tides are the G modes. And that's because uh, they can have these long periods, periods of days, which means they can be resonantly excited by the planet or the companion star, which also has a period of days, right? So you get into a situation where you have basically a driven damped harmonic oscillator that you're driving resonantly. You're driving these modes resonantly. Um, So there's a really neat uh, terrestrial example of this resonant dynamical tide here on Earth, uh, the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, Canada. So this is a bay that's about 300 kilometers in length. And the natural oscillation frequency of this bay is about 12.4 hours. Um, you know, if you think of the oscillation frequency of a bathtub, it's maybe a second, right? This is uh, because so so big, it's, it's 12.4 hours. And that just so happens to be the tidal forcing period due to the moon, right? So the moon is resonantly exciting the water in this bay. And as a result, you get this huge uh, tidal range, uh, 15 meters between high tide and low tide, vertical difference between high tide and low tide, um, you know, twice a day. So twice a day, you get, you know, this, and twice a day, you get that, right? All this water comes in and out of the bay um, due to this uh, resonant dynamical tide here on Earth. Um, and so in getting back to, to stars, uh, the tide can excite many waves in a star, but in linear theory, those waves all uh, pass through each other and don't interact. They sort of obey the principle of superposition, but pass right through each other like ships in the night, right? Whereas when you start accounting for nonlinear effects, these uh, second order and third order terms in your fluid forces, uh, you start getting wave-wave interactions. And so at second order, an important type of wave-wave interaction is uh, something known as a parametric instability, in which you have a 
uh, we can call a parent wave that's directly excited by the tide, by the forcing of the companion. And if it reaches large enough amplitude, it can excite daughter waves of half its frequency. Um, and whether that happens or not depends on the amplitude of the parent wave, the strength of the coupling in, this, in the vertex of this Feynman-like diagram. I know there's some high energy physicists here, <laughs> so shout out to them, right? And then there's uh, the frequency of the daughter waves and whether there's really uh, pairs of daughter waves that can add up to the, the parent wave frequency. Um, but the important thing is that if uh, this happens, if this instability occurs in the star, you have a new source of dissipation in the system, right? Because suddenly this parent wave can lose energy to these daughter waves. And those daughter waves themselves can have very short wavelength, much shorter than the parent. And so they can be much more efficient at uh, thermalizing the wave energy and you know, just depositing it as heat within the star. Um, and so this is a new source of dissipation that you have in nonlinear theory that's not there in linear theory and could potentially lead to uh, a faster rate of tide-induced orbital evolution. Um, so in a moment, I'll describe you know, where you have many uh, you know, tens of thousands of interacting waves. But as a sort of toy example, a toy model of the problem, I thought I'd start by just showing you what happens if you have uh, just a three-wave system. Um, and so uh, this plot here shows the energy of a parent wave as a function of time. And I initialize the parent to have basically zero energy, turned on the tide, and the parent starts growing in energy due to the tidal driving. And if I didn't have three wave interactions, the parent would follow this blue line here and reach some linear equilibrium. Basically, it's the solution to the driven damped harmonic oscillator problem that probably you, you've seen in your uh, undergraduate physics classes. But when you now allow for three wave interactions, when you now allow the parent to couple to other modes, or a pair of other modes in the star, what happens is the parent can reach a critical energy sort of shown by this uh, dashed line here, horizontal line. And rather than reach the linear uh, energy, it uh, starts to undergo this kind of sort of complicated limit cycle uh, interaction with a daughter pair, which initially has zero energy, but then grows exponentially, right? And so the nonlinear solution to the system is very different from the linear one. You have a parent that doesn't quite reach the same energy and a daughter pair that in linear theory would have effectively zero energy uh, excited to large energies. And so this can obviously then affect the efficiency or rate of dissipation in your system. Okay, and so uh, in terms of the uh, parameters of a binary, you can ask the question, which systems are unstable to these three wave interactions, to this parametric instability? And uh, the sort of relevant parameter space of the binary is the mass ratio of the binary shown on the vertical scale. So the mass of the planet or uh, companion star to the main star as a function of the orbital period. And this jagged black line here is the threshold for uh, the parametric instability. So anything below that line is stable to the uh, parametric instability, anything above it is unstable. And so as a point of reference, I put a hot Jupiter on this diagram. So you know, Jupiter has a mass of about 10 to the minus three, the mass of the sun. And if it's a hot Jupiter, it has an orbital period of a few days. And so you can see that a hot Jupiter is well inside the unstable region, well above that jagged line. Uh, if you think about a solar binary, those have mass ratios of order unity, right? There's two stars, maybe two sun-like stars orbiting each other. So they're sort of off the scale of this diagram. They'd be up here, but they'd be unstable out to tens of days to this parametric instability. So nonlinear effects are uh, extremely important in both these hot Jupiters and solar binaries. And you can do the same kind of analysis in different types of systems, white dwarf binaries, neutron star binaries, and show that in many cases uh, for the short period systems, uh, the nonlinear effects are important. The linear approximation fails, that you can't just ignore those nonlinear terms because it's simpler, right? You, you have to account for them if you really want to understand what's going on in your system. Um, right. And so the question then is, if you're unstable to these uh, wave interactions, what are the implications? How does it impact the evolution of these systems? Um, and so now I'm going to sort of start getting into the specific systems that we've studied and applied 
some of these um, ideas to. And so um, this is a problem that uh, my former student Reed Essick uh, investigated, the orbital decay of hot Jupiters. So as I mentioned, these planets are falling into, in spiraling into their host star, but the question is at what rate, right? Are they sitting out there for, uh, for uh, essentially eternity, right? Much longer to say than the main sequence lifetime of the star, or are they falling in relatively rapidly and we're only catching them in a moment before they uh, basically merge with their star. Um, and so uh, if you go back and look at this diagram again, right, these hot Jupiters are well inside this unstable region. So it's not as if there's just a single daughter pair that gets excited by the parent wave. You have uh, hundreds of daughter pairs that are unstable. Those daughter pairs reach such large energies that they excite granddaughters. And those granddaughters reach such large energies that they excite uh, great granddaughters. And you get this kind of cascade of modes of waves excited in the star. And so what we did is simulate the resonant excitation of tens of thousands of these interacting modes by solving a large set of nonlinear coupled amplitude equations for these systems. And so here's just one example of one of his uh, simulation. So this is showing uh, mode energy versus time for some of the modes in one of his mode networks. We're not, uh, I think it's one out of every hundred modes. If we showed all of them, it would just be uh, a, a blur and you wouldn't see anything. So we just picked out one out of every hundred randomly. And what you see is that the energies fluctuate in kind of this chaotic way. At any given moment, there's, uh, you know, the different colors of different modes. So some of the modes are excited some of the time and then they, they die off and another mode is excited. So there's kind of this randomness to the energy of the modes. But if you then ask, what's the dissipation in the system? And the way you can calculate that is by calculating the damping rate through to each mode times its energy and summing all those up, right? And so each mode contributes a small amount. You sum up each of the modes contributions and you get this plot on the right. This is showing uh, the total dissipation as a function of time. And after a kind of burn-in period for our uh, run, you sort of, you get a, uh, a saturation of the, uh, of the uh, dissipation. You basically reach a nonlinear equilibrium that you can turn into a measurement of the total dissipation in your system, which in turn tells you how much energy is being pulled out of the orbit and thermalized inside the star, which then tells you the rate of uh, the orbital decay of the planet, how quickly its period is, uh, decreasing with time. And so uh, this is what uh, we found. So in terms of, again, this quality factor, um, which is again, a measurement of how efficient the dissipation is in the star. Uh, we found that for a Jupiter mass planet in a one day orbit, the Q of the star is around uh, 10 to the five, 10 to the six, right? Which is, uh, orders of magnitude smaller than linear theory prediction. Linear theory, if you did the same kind of analysis but ignored the nonlinear terms, would give you Qs of 10 to the nine, 10 to the 10, um, which would uh, say that the planet should basically sit there for, for all time. The decay is so slow that you shouldn't uh, have to worry about it or think that it's gonna happen on a time scale of the star's evolution at all. Whereas when you account for these nonlinear effects and account for the fact that Q is this small, you find that the orbital decay time is less than a billion years for planets on orbital periods less than about two days. Meaning that the planet is gonna, the orbit is gonna decay in a significant way um, on less than the time scale of the uh, age of the star. And uh, it, you know, then the question of course is, is there evidence, observational evidence for such orbital decay? Um, and so there is some indirect evidence so you can do a statistical analysis of the number distribution of hot Jupiters, how many hot Jupiters there are as a function of orbital period. And, um, and there's indications that there's fewer very short period planets than, um, than you would expect if, uh, if only linear theory was at play. And so there's the evidence of a clearing out of the shortest period systems. Uh, but there's not that many hot Jupiters with, with orbital periods less than two days. There's maybe uh, a dozen or so. Um, and so there's sort of, you're sort of in the small number statistics regime. So you can't do a really precise measurement of Q in this way. Um, there's some hope that the TESS space mission, um, I know some of you take observational data with TESS. Um, you know, so uh, 
uh, not in the context of, of exoplanets, but but you know obviously you know one of the goals of tests is to find uh, exoplanets and find hot Jupiters, and so it's finding many more hot Jupiters, and so um, there's some hope that we'll have better statistics in the coming years um, and be able to uh, do this kind of analysis uh, more definitively. That said, there is a really interesting hot Jupiter system called WASP-12b, which shows uh, direct evidence of orbital decay. So this is a planet on an especially short orbital period of just a little over, little over a day. Um, and what astronomers have been able to do, so they, just, they detected this planet um, uh, in like something like 15 years ago and measured its orbital period really well through the transit timing, uh, basically the planet eclipses its host star. And what these uh, transit timing observations do is they come back 10 years later, 15 years later, and look at where the planet is, right? And they can uh, say, if the period was perfectly constant, the planet should be exactly at this spot 15 years later, right? It'll, it'll have orbited the star you know, thousands of times in that time scale. but if the period is really constant, you can be able to say exactly where it should be. And instead what they find for this system is that the, uh, it's a little bit ahead of where it ought to have been if the period were constant. Uh, it's consistent with the period decreasing at a rate of something like 30 milliseconds per year, right? Not much, but look at the precision at which they can measure that. Uh, again, because they're sort of integrating over this long time scale. And so if you turn that into a time scale, a P over P dot, you get a decay time scale of 3 million years. So much, you know, much less than a billion years, much less than the, the lifetime of a star. Um, and so then the natural question to ask is, can you understand this as being the result of tidal dissipation of orbital decay? Um, and so uh, we studied this problem because it seemed like this is the ideal system for the kind of problems, kind of uh, questions we're interested in. And so we analyzed the system uh, specifically and found that if the star is a subgiant, then what can happen is you excite a wave, uh, internal gravity wave, in the outer parts of the star at the radiative convective interface for, for subtle reasons. Um, uh, you know, if, you, if you ask me, I can tell you them. Um, and what happens is that internal gravity wave starts propagating towards the center of the star. And as it propagates, its, uh, it, uh, its amplitude de increases due to geometric focusing. So basically you're trying to put the same amount of wave luminosity in a smaller and smaller volume of the star. And so the amplitude uh, uh, increases. And what we found is that the amplitude gets so large as it approaches the center of the star that the amplitude becomes larger than the wavelength of the wave. Delta R becomes larger than lambda. And that's the condition for what's called wave breaking. Um, so we've all seen this when we go to the beach and the waves come to the shore and they crash, they turn over and crash. So these waves propagated you know, thousands of kilometers in the open ocean and then deposit all their energy right at the shoreline. Just like this wave propagates throughout the whole star and then deposits all of its energy and angular momentum right in the center or very close to the center of the star. So this is sort of maximally efficient tidal dissipation. This is an example of strongly nonlinear, not even weakly nonlinear like the um, parametric instability that I was talking about, strongly nonlinear wave breaking. Um, and so you can do a calculation of this and find, what we found is that the uh, implied dissipation is uh, very close to the one that you observe, that there's a good agreement between the theory estimate and the uh, observation of uh, period change. And so I think this is a really nice uh, example of, of, uh, of nonlinear tidal dissipation. The one sort of outstanding question that remains is, is this star truly a subgiant? Um, so from the parameters of the system, we can't quite rule out the possibility that it's uh, not a main sequence star, right? There's sort of an open question whether the star is on the main sequence or has just evolved off the main sequence and in a subgiant. And that matters because it changes the structure of the star and therefore the efficiency of tidal dissipation. And so really to, to answer that question, we need more precise measurements of its stellar parameters. Um, you know, people have tried to do that with, with Gaia and, and seismic measurements. Um, there isn't, I don't think, great prospects of doing much better than they've done, but, but it sort of, again, is an open question that remains to be uh, answered. Okay, so uh, another aspect of hot Jupiters that I think is interesting and, uh, and of course, important is the, how they form, right? How do you 
form a planet so massive, so close to uh, its host star. So you can show that in the uh, protoplanetary disk, that close to the protostar, the temperatures are so high that you don't expect uh, gravitational instabilities in the disk to form a hot Jupiter. You don't expect the direct formation of a Jupiter mass planet that close to a star. So the uh, preferred explanation for how you form these system, systems is that they form somewhere further out, maybe where our Jupiter forms. And then somehow some mechanism brings them into this very short period orbit close to the star. Um, and so one mechanism that people uh, consider is something known as high eccentricity migration. The idea is you have this planet on initially a circular orbit far out. It gets kicked into a very eccentric orbit by another planet in the system. There's a third planet or second planet in the system, a third body in the system that perturbs the Jupiter and puts it on a very eccentric orbit, eccentricities of 0.99. And as a result, the planet passes really close to the host star. The paracenter passage is only uh, you know, maybe 10 stellar radii or even less. Um, and as a result, the tides are really strong. The tides, not just in the star, I've been focusing on tides in the star, but the tides also in the planet become really strong. And, um, and the idea is that those tides will circularize the system Tides remove, uh, uh, yeah, tend, tend to circularize systems, and you end up with a the hot Jupiters we see, these nice circular short period systems that we see. Uh, the problem with this high eccentricity uh, migration scenario is that if you assume the tidal dissipation in the planet is like our like our own Jupiters, um, corresponding to Qs of around 100,000, the prediction before Kepler went up was that there should be uh, several high eccentricity systems in the Kepler sample, whereas Kepler didn't see any. Right? And so well, what does that tell you? Well, one possibility is that maybe high, uh, the high eccentricity migration scenario isn't responsible for the formation of mo most hot Jupiters. Maybe it's just, there's another mechanism. And there's, there are others, people talk about disk migration where the planet in spirals in a disk as opposed to high eccentricity migration. Um, but the other possible solution um, is that maybe this assumption that our planet, that these hot Jupiters have uh, the same quality factor as uh, our own Jupiter is incorrect. Maybe their Qs are much less than 10 to the five and they circularize so fast that uh, it's not surprising that Kepler didn't see them because they spend so short a time in that phase of their evolution that, they're, that you just wouldn't have expected Kepler to see any question. How many hot Jupiters? Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to, uh, I should repeat the question. So how many, the question was how many hot Jupiters there are in the Kepler sample? Um, I think there's, there's, you know, on the order of dozens, you know, tens of, yeah. So when you say several, you mean, wow, you know, Yeah, like, yeah, three or four or five. Yeah. So, you know, there, the, the error bars are actually big enough that you can say, well, maybe we just got unlucky, um, you know, because you're sort of small numbers and, in the six. And the, the, that several, that was for linear uh, title. That's for, for linear title theory where you assume that Q is 10 to the five. That's correct. Um, so there's a, uh, an important class or type of title and interaction that takes place in very eccentric systems. This is something that goes by the name of diffusive tide. It was first uh, discovered in the mid nineties in the context of stellar binaries but more recently has been applied in the context of, uh, of these highly uh, eccentric hot Jupiters and the high eccentricity migration scenario. The idea is the following. As the planet passes through paracenter and gets really close to the host star, the uh, tidal kick of the planet, the tidal perturbation of the planet excites the F mode of the planet. And F mode is the fundamental, F stands for fundamental mode of the planet. Um, and that tidal kick is so strong that it excites the F mode to a large amplitude, that uh, F mode can back react on the orbit. Basically, the energy of the F mode is uh, so large, it takes so much energy out of the orbit that it changes the orbital period uh, enough that the next time the planet comes around, 
the phase of the F mode is slightly different from the phase it was in the previous paracenter passage. And so you get this kind of random uh, feedback interaction between the phase of the mode, um, each paracenter passage, and you get, uh, you can show it's, uh, you can show that it, the, the energy of the F mode undergoes a kind of random walk, uh, uh, diffusive walk, um, so that the energy increases uh, linear, linearly with orbital cycle. Um, and, uh, and then the question, you know, this is something that people appreciated uh, a few years ago, and, and uh, we got to think about this problem and realize that the mode energy can become so large that, again, you start wondering about nonlinear effects and how uh, important those might be in, in understanding what's going on. And so, uh, so with uh, my former student, who's again now a postdoc at Caltech, he uh, and uh, Phil Harris and I uh, studied this problem and found that indeed nonlinear mode coupling can be important in these systems and uh, lead to a very efficient dissipation of mode energy. Uh, uh, so efficient that you would expect the Q of the planet during this high eccentricity phase to be only around 10 or 100. So, uh, so small, the efficiency so great that it very rapidly circularizes the orbit on timescales of tens of thousands of years. And that timescale is short enough that it's then not surprising that Kepler didn't see any high eccentricity systems. The phase that they're in uh, lasts for such a brief time, given the sufficient dissipation, that it's not surprising Kepler didn't detect any of these systems. Um, okay, so. Um, so uh, I'm not gonna have time here to go into uh, tides in binary neutral stars. I still wanna leave time for uh, the seismology uh, of red giants. Um, I'll just briefly mention uh, some of the key things that we've thought about and why tides might be important in these uh, very interesting systems. So these are, of course, systems that the LIGO gravitational wave detector has, uh, has observed. There's been two binary neutral star systems that LIGO saw. Um, and uh, to a first approximation, you can treat these neutron stars as point masses, but since they're uh, actually merging at some point in the in-spiral, tides are uh, going to be uh, important. And the question is, uh, uh, how does that impact the gravitational wave signal? So tides will speed up the rate of in-spiral by some, some amount. They remove energy and angular momentum from the orbit uh, on top of the loss of energy and angular momentum associated with the gravitational waves. And so that is a signal that in principle you can uh, hope to see with gravitational waves. And if you can detect it, you can use it as a constraint on the properties of the neutron star and say something perhaps interesting about the equation of state in the core of the neutron star, which is a significant unknown uh, because the densities are several times the nucleus of uh, terrestrial uh, uh, matter. And we can't probe such high densities in uh, in the lab, and if we can use astrophysics to, uh, of neutron stars to do it, uh, we learn something not just interesting astrophysically, but about fundamental physics, about the strong force in QCD. Um, and so uh, people have, of, of course, wondered about this problem, but just like with the, the stellar and binaries and hot Jupiters that I talked about, they've in large part ignored nonlinear effects. They've said, well, let's just do the linear problem. Let's also treat the neutron star as a normal fluid as opposed to a superfluid, which we think they are because they're old and cold. Um, and so uh, in, in some studies that we've been doing, uh, we showed that both effects can be potentially important, that superfluid effects might impact the tidal um, signature and the gravitational wave signal, as well as nonlinear effects. But as I said, I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, uh, have time here to go into those details, but I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards if, if they have questions. Um, instead, yeah, what I'd like to do for my you know, remaining 10 minutes here or so is to switch gears a little bit and talk about waves in isolated stars, uh, stars that are not in a binary, so the waves are not excited because of tides, but instead are excited due to internal motions within the star. For example, um, convective motions within the star. And so in the 1960s, uh, astronomers uh, made the unexpected discovery that our own sun is awash in sound waves. The photosphere of the sun 
is, uh, is just uh, oscillating in sound waves. This is uh, an actual image of a small patch of their sun taken by uh, the Stanford Solar Telescope. And those variations are basically sound waves that are excited by turbulent motions in the convective zone of the star. So again, the outer third of the sun is convective and these sort of bubbling eddies excite sound waves that we see at the surface. The characteristic time scale of those oscillations is minutes. There's what's this famous five minute oscillation of the sun, which is the characteristic period of these oscillations. Um, so this movie that I just showed is uh, sped up significantly in time. It would be kind of boring to watch a movie of something very on a five minute time scale, but the idea is the same. But what you can then do is, uh, is do a Fourier transform of those fluctuations and get a power spectrum. And this is uh, what you find. So this is power as a function of frequency. And you see uh, individual spikes at specific frequencies in the power spectrum. And those frequencies correspond to oscillation modes of the sun. So you're seeing the ringing of the sun, much like uh, you know, an instrument has a characteristic modes of oscillation. Uh, you're seeing the characteristic modes of oscillation of, of our sun. And what's interesting about that, by analyzing where those uh, spikes occur and their frequency spacings, you're, you can learn about the internal properties of the sun. So even though you're seeing the, only the surface aspect of the waves, those waves propagate throughout the sun. And, uh, and their uh, internal, uh, and, and the spectrum depends on uh, how the, the material they're propagating through, the internal properties of the sun, very much like you can use uh, earthquakes on, you know, and the seismic measurements of earthquakes to learn about the crust of the earth, uh, you know, the, the mantle, the inner and outer core. Um, you can do the same with the sun. You can basically see inside the star. Um, and so for, 50 years or so, the sun was really the only star where you can do such a measurement with significant precision. But about a decade ago, 15 years ago, this field really underwent a revolution. And that was in large part due to uh, the Kepler Space Telescope. So Kepler was designed to see uh, detect exoplanets by looking at for transits of these planets in front of the host star. And it needed really good photometry to do that. And one of the sort of secondary pieces of science that came out of that was that it could, it was really good at looking for luminosity fluctuations in isolated stars. Uh, so we can measure fluctuations of like a part per million in these stars uh, uh, enough to see the waves, the impact of the waves on the brightness of the star. And so it made such astrocytic measurements for tens of thousands of stars, including tens of thousands of red giants. So of course a red giant is a star that uh, has evolved off the main sequence. It's no longer burning hydrogen in its core, and it's gotten really big and puffy, uh, and it has a convection zone that excites these waves. And so just like with the sun, you can take a, a Fourier transform of the light curve of these stars, and, uh, and you see something uh, similar. You see these spikes at specific frequencies corresponding to oscillation modes of the red giant. Um, and so this, uh, these kind of measurements for, again, tens of thousands of red giants has uh, allowed astronomers to probe the evolutionary state of, the, uh, of these red giants, uh, measure the rotation profile, which has uh, interesting implications for the uh, 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 angular momentum evolution of these stars, um, and also provided really powerful scaling relations that tell you from just any one star, its mass, radius, and age with significant accuracy. I mean, if you think about it, when you look at a star, you really have no idea what its mass and radius is, right? But suddenly we have this way of measuring those properties for tens of thousands of stars across our galaxy. So this has impacted not just stellar physics, but also galactic physics. Um, there's a field called galactic archeology span that, uh, that sort of underwent a, 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 a revolution too because of these measurements, because suddenly now you can age and uh, measure the mass and, composition of stars um, across, all across our galaxy with great precision. Um, and so one of the things that Kepler uh, saw, noticed, is that the amplitude of the oscillations of the red giants increases significantly the more evolved the red giant is. The more evolved the red giant is, the larger it is. It gets bigger and puffier the older it gets. And 
the larger the observed amplitude of the oscillations were. Um, uh, so that's sort of shown schematically in the plot on the top, more uh, um, uh, uh, quantitatively in the uh, plot on the bottom, this is showing uh, oscillation amplitude delta L over L, luminosity fluctuations in parts per million as a function of the luminosity to mass ratio of the star. And so as a reference point, here's the sun. So it has uh, luminosity fluctuations of about a part per million. Whereas the red giants have luminosity fluctuations of, uh, of tens to hundreds of parts per million. So the energy is that squared. So the energies of the modes in these red giants is thousands of times larger, tens of thousands of times larger than in the sun. And so people have wondered whether nonlinear effects are important in the sun and, and they're sort of maybe marginally important. But given that the energies are so much larger in these red giants, the question is, um, uh, you know, that we were interested in is, is uh, are nonlinear effects important in these systems? And uh, do we need to account for them if we want to fully understand what's going on in these stars? Um, um, these are just red, uh, so the, what I'm going to be talking about is just red giants. But of course, Kepler saw, uh, you know, made astrocytic measurements for very, a wide variety of class of variables, um, including um, AGB stars. Um, right, and so uh, one of the sort of uh, observational motivations for considering uh, these uh, nonlinear effects in these red giants is a, uh, a mystery, uh, sometimes referred to as the suppressed dipole modes. So, uh, so here are the power spectra of two red giants. Uh, they're both very similar in mass and radius and age. Um, but what you can see, and so the color coding is a different uh, degree of the oscillation mode. So black is L equals zero. So if you remember your spherical harmonics, those are radial modes, right? L equals one is dipole modes, L equals two is quadrupole. And so the one at the top shows power in the dipole modes in the L equals one modes. Whereas the one at the bottom shows very little power in the dipole modes. Um, but otherwise these two stars are very similar. So it's kind of uh, mysterious as to why one would show uh, power in a dipole mode and the other one not. And so one of the explanations put forward is that maybe in the one that shows suppressed dipole modes, there's significant, uh, there's a large magnetic field. And that magnetic field through a process known as the magnetic greenhouse effect basically traps the energy of the dipole modes um, in the interior uh, scatters the mode, the waves, and prevents them from having large amplitudes at their surface. And so if that's the right explanation, that would be extremely interesting because it would be a, a way of measuring the magnetic fields in the cores of these red giants. We don't even know the magnetic field in the interior of the sun, right? And suddenly this is saying you can measure the magnetic fields in these thousands of red giants um, across our galaxy. Um, but you know, one question we uh, were wondering is, well, what if it's not some sort of magnetic effect, but maybe it's nonlinear mode dampening. Maybe nonlinear interactions are suppressing the modes in some of these stars. And that's the true explanation for uh, the suppressed dipole modes in, in these systems. Um, and so uh, we basically did an analysis very similar to the one we did for the hot Jupiter. Uh, problem. Uh, we uh, showed first that the uh, modes in these red giants have such large energies that they would excite secondary modes. Um, parent waves have such large energies that they excite daughter waves, which excite granddaughters. And so this is, again, a plot of energy versus time. So the black uh, line is a parent wave who's being directly driven by turbulent motions in the convective zone of the star. And it has such large energy that it excites daughter waves in red. Those daughter waves reach large energies, excite granddaughter waves. And again, you have this cascade of modes excited. And so we uh, analyzed this, uh, these systems, uh, these mode networks for uh, a range of red giant masses at a range of evolutionary states. And, uh, and just sort of to cut to the, to the chase of what we found. Um, so you can ask the question, by how much is the energy of the modes suppressed due to the nonlinear interactions compared to the linear theory predictions? So, um, you know, there you can talk in terms of the suppression factor of the energy of the modes due to nonlinear damping. And so, the different colors here 
R4 uh, reg ions, all of a two solar mass, but at different uh, stages of their evolution. So the least evolved is in blue. Um, and the suppression factor for the least evolved is pretty minimal, maybe 10% uh, or so due to nonlinear damping. But as you uh, consider more and more evolved red giants, the suppression factor can be significant. And it could be as much as 80 or 90% for the most evolved red giants that Kepler sees. So you know, the implication is that these nonlinear effects are uh, significantly uh, damping the modes in the star. The question then, of course, is, does that explain the suppressed dipole mode? Um, and so uh, we found that uh, it maybe can explain the suppressed dipole modes in the more evolved red giants, um, but in the less evolved red giants where you do still see suppressed dipole modes, it doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to explain uh, the, the, the detection of suppressed dipole modes in less evolved red giants. Um, that said, I think there's still uh, outstanding questions that remain about the, the role of nonlinear effects in these systems. So we focused on this parametric instability that I talked about earlier. There's other types of nonlinear interactions. There's uh, interactions in which you could have two parent waves exciting a daughter wave of uh, twice the parent wave frequency, what um, uh, you might call direct nonlinear forcing. And so uh, with my uh, current graduate student at UTA, Mohammed Morabit, we're planning on uh, studying exactly that problem and addressing whether maybe that effect can explain the suppressed dipole modes. Okay, so uh, to conclude, um, I think one of the takeaway uh, messages is that uh, that linear the linear approximation is often not a good one. It helps simplify the problem, but is not a good enough motivation for uh, assuming it. Um, and that's true in in uh, a wide variety of binaries. And when you start accounting for these nonlinear effects, uh, we're finding that they can significantly uh, enhance the rate of tidal dissipation. So this has implications for the formal formation and evolution of hot Jupiters, and also for compact object binaries like binary neutron stars. Uh, and then finally, towards the end, I mentioned uh, the role of nonlinear effects on the amplitudes, line widths, and frequencies in astrocytic measurements of evolved stars like red giants. And so this is uh, uh, you know, something that we've been studying now for almost 10 years, right? And, and continuing to study, because I think there's a lot of open questions that remain um, about high eccentricity migration in different types of systems, uh, not just uh, planetary systems, uh, the role of tides in binary white dwarfs, which are important sources for future gravitational wave missions like the LISA space uh, mission and other types of pulsars. So not just red giants, but Cepheids, Arolyri, Delta Scuti, all of which um, have been uh, detected with Kepler are continuing to be detected with tests. And I think one of the really important uh, uh, takeaways too is that this is a field with uh, an amazing set of data, right? There's just a wealth of really great data that exists um, from Kepler and tests and, and in LIGO and uh, has a great future. There's gonna be, uh, uh, future missions like PLATO, um, uh, which is a future uh, you know, planetary detection, but also uh, astro-seismic measurement uh, mission, um, and, and LISA, this gravitational wave detector in space, and future versions of ground-based gravitational wave detectors like the Cosmic Explorer. So I think this is going to be a really exciting area for, for many years to come. Um, so I will stop there, and uh, thank you for, for your attention. and happy to take questions. Oh, yes, he put it here. Uh, I don't know if you know how to yeah, think. Oh, you know, I think I may have to turn turn this off, right? Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So this might be a bit of a basic question, but you have all these nonlinear effects. Uh, I presume you calculate all these just numerically, or is there analytical solutions? And um, how many orders, 
I mean, what's sort of the largest order that you need to get to before you can start neglecting them? Yeah, so those, those are both uh, great questions. So, um, so you, you can get analytic solutions as long as you restrict yourself to like three mode systems, um, uh, which, uh, you know, you, you can't assume for these systems because there are so many modes excited. So you uh, really have to just solve them numerically. So we uh, solve a large set of coupled amplitude equations. Um, let's see, let me have a, uh, so here's a uh, sort of backup slide showing an example of an amplitude equation. So A is the amplitude of the modes. Uh, and so the first three terms are you know, what you might identify as a damped oscillator. And then there's the driving term, which you, you know, if you include that one, then you have a driven damped harmonic oscillator. And then the last term is this three wave coupling. And so you have uh, you know, many of these equations and we're solving those all simultaneously. Uh, um, you know, basically it's just a, a large set of coupled ODEs that you're solving uh, on a cluster. Um, and, um, and then your next question was, uh, I think, uh, you know, how many terms in the expansion of your perturbation theory do you need to go to? And that's, that's also a great question. Um, so, uh, so you can construct arguments to show that the next term in the perturbation theory, the cubic term, is unlikely to be important in, in many cases, but that's not always the case. So for example, in the neutron star binary problem, uh, it turns out that the next term in the perturbation expansion can also be significant. Um, and uh, so really, you know, the only uh, definitive way of, of showing that is to include the next nonlinear term and see how much is that contributing compared to the previous term. Um, but um, but for, for the most part, uh, as long as you're not strongly nonlinear, uh, you can uh, truncate at, at second or third order. Okay. Can you go back to your last slide? So um, I was going to ask this question anyways, but you sort of led into it. Um, do you, um, we have the students and are actually here that we just talked about some of these objects, the RLIRAs and the Delta Scooties. Um, do you have any sense for what the effects will be for those? They're very different, obviously, than neutron stars or, or the red giants. Um, the densities are a lot higher. Delta scooties have a lot of non-radial modes. Like, what, what do you do? You have a sense for what the so, impact so might be? We're actually we're starting uh, we're starting with the delta scooties um, um, uh, because there's actually there is uh, observations um, some groups from UC Austin that show evidence of nonlinear mode coupling from these systems. That show evidence yeah, of, of nonlinear mode coupling. Uh, so you get. Uh, basically a wave and you have pairs of waves whose frequencies add up to that other wave. And so, um, and so there's, uh, there's sort of those, that motivation, observational motivation uh, for, for Delta Scudies. For Cepheids and our Lyrae, um, I think it's, it's entirely plausible that not only are effects important. In fact, we know that they're important. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the radial expansion of these stars is a significant fraction of their actual radius. Um, and people who do uh, you know, the theory, the simulations of these systems have to account for the fully nonlinear fluid effects. Um, but those are kind of large scale waves, um, sort of uh, wavelengths of order the, the size of the star. Um, I think there's interesting questions about whether those waves excite shorter wavelength waves and what role those play uh, on, in the dissipation of, of, of wave energy. But, um, but yeah, we haven't, we haven't gotten to those yet, but I hope to one day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you.